Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us and welcome to this September Living with Disability Research Centre um, Research Seminar. Um, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which uh, Lincoln and I are on this afternoon, which is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, if you've joined us before, then you'll know that you can put Q &A, uh, questions in the Q&A um, and we'll, we'll um, uh, endeavour to answer the questions that are there. Um, if you want to turn on the closed captions, you just need to go down to the bottom where it says show captions and press that and that should, should put, turn those on. Um, we generally have the first speaker will speak for maybe half an hour and then we'll have questions. Um, and then we'll have a, a short two minute break and then the second speaker will speak and we'll have questions again. So there should be plenty of time um, for people to put their ideas in um, and to ask questions. So this research that we're talking about this afternoon uh, comes from the longitudinal study um, about group homes and other types of supported accommodation that we've been doing at the centre uh, for quite a long time now, and it focuses on different perspectives um, about uh, group homes. So it's perspectives about staff and perspectives from families. So uh, Dr. Lincoln Humphreys is going to is going to start this afternoon talking about um, staff satisfaction experiences. So over to you, Lincoln. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so. This afternoon, I'm presenting a study on the organizational predictors of staff satisfaction in supported accommodation services. And this is a study that Chris and I have done together. So just as a background, there's been a long history of research examining job satisfaction of frontline staff working in services for people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, this research has been going on at least since the late 1970s um, from institutions, group homes, and even recently into other types of uh, services. This research is often based on the idea that by increasing job satisfaction of staff, that it will enhance staff performance and it will reduce staff turnover. So both of those things are obviously important to organizations, um, that if you have staff who are satisfied, then they're going to be more committed to their role, better at providing support, uh, more motivated compared to those who have less job satisfaction. And the other idea is that staff are satisfied with their work, then they're gonna be less likely to be looking for other work or have intentions to leave. And there's actually some good evidence in other fields that um, job satisfaction is connected to uh, reduced turnover or intention to leave. So in the disability services, uh, many factors have been examined as potentially associated with job satisfaction of staff. And by staff, I mean support workers and um, frontline supervisors, so team, lead, uh, team leaders or house supervisors, whatever term you want to use. It's the role of the person that uh, support workers uh, report to. So as I said, there's been many factors associated with job satisfaction that can be grouped into three broad categories. Uh, one is the characteristics of staff or the worker. So for instance, their age, their level of education, uh, their experience, whether they're casual, part-time, full-time. Um, the other is the characteristics of people supported. So the main variable that's been examined is uh, challenge behavior. And then the third major characteristic is organizational. So things like role clarity, role conflict, um, the support that staff get from their supervisor or colleagues, team climate, practice leadership, and whether they've uh, received training. <clears throat> However, a uh, weakness of many of these studies has been a reliance on correlation to examine the associations between these variables and job satisfaction. Uh, so what I mean by that is uh, a study may just look at the direct relationship, say, between education and job satisfaction. But in doing so, it means that the other potential variables aren't considered in that uh, aren't considered in that analysis. So you, they might find there's a direct relationship between let's say education and job satisfaction. But if you use model progression, you're putting several variables into that analysis together. So let's say you put in 
education, role clarity, um, or in team climate. And at that point, because there's multiple variables that are going in, you may find that education isn't a significant be associated with job satisfaction. So multiple regression is better to examine these relationships than uh, correlation. However, an issue with many of the studies is they conduct the analysis at one level. So either the individual worker level or the service level, so the, the group home level. And the issue with that is you can uh, is how you interpret the results because you may have what's called type one or type two error. So type one error is your finding significant associations when you shouldn't, or type two error is when you failed or you haven't found significant associations when you should. Uh, so despite all this though, looking at the evidence that has been conducted into job satisfaction is that it indicates that organizational factors are important. And there's some researchers who argue that organizational factors are the most important in terms of staff satisfaction. So one uh, potential factor that is currently under-researched is organizational culture. Um, to my knowledge, there's only been one study that's examined uh, the relationship between culture and staff satisfaction that was conducted by Chris Hatton and, the, and colleagues in the UK more than 20 years ago. And they found that job satisfaction is, was correlated with um, culture, with uh, the nine dimensions of culture using uh, a particular measure, which was called the organizational culture profile. So this is a measure that wasn't designed specifically to be used in um, disability services. It's a generic measure of culture. Uh, so it's been used in other fields like business, for instance. Uh, so an example of the dimensions uh, using the organizational culture profile is achievement oriented, rewarding staff, innovative. So Hatton in their study um, pointed out or concluded that the organizational culture measure used in this study was not designed specifically for services. It is possible that important aspects of culture in these services were not addressed. Um, so at the time when Chris Hatton conducted their study, um, there was no measure of culture that was specifically designed to examine it in uh, services for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, since then, there's been a measure called the Group Home Culture Scale that's been developed, which is designed to specifically um, measure staff perceptions of culture in accommodation services for people with intellectual disabilities. So this measure is completed by support workers and frontline supervisors. Um, there are 50 items in the measure and staff rate their um, perceptions using strongly disagree to strongly agree about uh, characteristics in the service that they work. Um, and then responses from three or more staff from that particular service are sort of combined and aggregated to, go, to give a uh, indication of the culture in that service. Um, so there are seven dimensions of culture in the group home culture scale, which are presented there in that table. So a few of them are alignment of staff with organizational values. So this is that um, the shared values of staff that work in the group home are aligned with those of the organization's core values. Effective team leadership. So this is the frontline supervisor transmits and embeds a positive culture. Um, another dimension is collaboration within the organization. So this is about um, staff support from senior managers and the sort of the relationship between senior managers and frontline staff. So given that culture has been under-researched in um, field of disability services, accommodation services, and that we've now got a measure of culture that is specific to um, these services, the aim of this study was to address the question, what are the organizational predictors of job satisfaction for frontline staff working in support and accommodation services? So the aim was to test which of these dimensions of culture um, are associated with staff job satisfaction. But in order to do this, uh, we needed to have a secondary aim, which was to uh, look at the dimensions of the particular measure of job satisfaction that we used in this study. <clears throat> so the scale that we use to measure job satisfaction, it's been around for quite a long time, at least 
uh, since the 1990s. Um, it's a scale that's been frequently used in the UK. Even recent studies use this scale to measure job satisfaction in disability services. <clears throat> However, an issue in how they conduct their analyses is they treat um, the scale as if it's just one dimension of job satisfaction. But this hasn't always been the case. In the early studies using this uh, measure, there's actually multiple dimensions, like in the study by Alan and colleagues, for example, I think they had four um, dimensions of job satisfaction um, that underline this scale. So for some reason, more recently, they've been sort of treating it as if it's um, just one scale. So uh, in order to conduct the analysis for this study, we want to do a factor analysis to see what are the underlying dimensions of this scale. And uh, over the years, this scale has been modified. So originally it just had 17 items, but other people have added to it and now there's 25 items. So it was sort of to also see where do these 25 items fit or how do they sort of group together or cluster together to form um, dimensions of job satisfaction. <clears throat> so the data for this study um, came from the longitudinal study into active support that we've been doing at Latrobe, which I'm sure many people are aware of. So this is a study that's been going since at least 2009, uh, looking at active support, the implementation and evaluation of active support in Australian um, supported accommodation services. So for this particular study, uh, we used a subset of data, um, which was collected in 2022 to 2024 in 15 organizations across Australia. Most of the services that were part of the study were small group homes. So on average, um, there were four uh, residents in each group home, but there was a range of one resident to eight residents. So most were sort of in that three to four, uh, three to four residents per group home. So for this study, we collected data in uh, four different ways. The first is um, staff self-report survey. So we administered an electronic survey, which comprised the measure of job satisfaction, um, the group home culture scale, a measure of role clarity, and a measure of role conflict. So these particular scales have been widely used in both research of disability services and in other fields as well. These, these two measures are actually quite commonly used, uh, have shown to have good reliability and good validity. In addition, staff reported on their own characteristics. So for instance, their age, their gender, their highest level of education um, and their experience, how long they've been working in disability services, how long they've been working in their current service. And they answered questions about whether they've had training in active support or positive behavior support, which is just yes, no responses. We also administered a survey uh, to collect data about the characteristics of the people supported in the group homes. So this survey was completed by a staff member that knew um, each of the people well. So the two scales that are uh, relevant to this particular study I'm presenting on today, there was a measure of adaptive behavior and there was a measure of challenge behavior. We also collected data uh, by researchers going into the services and, and doing observations to, um, to get data on the levels of engagement of the people supported. Uh, so what this meant was that a researcher was going into the services for two hours between four and six o'clock of an afternoon and just observing how much the people supported were engaged in um, meaningful activities and social interactions. And so getting a, a measurement of the proportion of time they're actually engaged in meaningful activities. In addition to that, a researcher interviewed each of the frontline supervisors and completed um, a measure of practice leadership. So practice leadership comprises um, five dimensions of um, how, they, uh, uh, how the frontline supervisor manages the staff team and manages the service. So for instance, um, supervising staff, team meetings, um, observing staff and giving feedback, coaching, allocating and organizing staff support and uh, focusing on quality of life. And then at the end of that interview, the researcher rates them on a scale of one to five in terms of how well they're performing or um, exhibiting um, those aspects of practice leadership. 
So how we conducted the analysis for this study for the first one to examine the underlying um, dimensions of the job satisfaction scale, we conducted an exploratory factor analysis. So for this, we had data from 788 frontline staff. So that's um, certainly big enough to conduct this analysis um, to examine the underlying dimensions of the job satisfaction scale. Um, naturally, the more uh, support workers and supervisors that comprise um, this sample. But the main analysis that we're doing to address the questions for this study was multi-level modeling to predict job satisfaction. So for this, we had data from 330 frontline staff who worked in 74 accommodation services. So multi-level modeling overcomes um, the weaknesses of previous studies because multi-level modeling enables variables at both individual and service levels to be examined simultaneously. So what that means is that um, to see what is associated with job satisfaction, we can put variables in at what's called level one or they're variables that are uh, about the individual worker. So for instance, um, their experience, their education, um, their scores on the measure of role clarity and role conflict, we can put them in uh, into the model to see how it's related to job satisfaction. But at the same time, we can also stick in the other variables, which are the service level or the level two uh, variables. So these are variables that are sort of properties of the service as opposed to properties of the individual. So we can put in uh, the scores on the group and culture scale. We can put in the scores of practice leadership. Uh, for this analysis, I put in both the overall scores and the scores for uh, each of the domains of practice leadership. Um, and also put in the score, the average level across the residents, uh, their scores on the adaptive behavior, challenge behavior and engagement. So what I mean by that is, if there, for instance, there were uh, four people who lived in the group home, then I took the average level of engagement across those four residents and put that in as a service level variable. So multi-level modeling enabled these uh, variables at two different levels to go in at the same time, which provides a bit more of a, a more comprehensive uh, way to examine what is associated with job satisfaction. So I'll just talk about the sample, the staff sample um, that comprised uh, who were participants in this study. So most of the staff participants were female uh, making up 60% of the sample. In terms of the ca age categories, most people were either aged between 36 to 40 or in the 51 to 55 years category. Uh, but there was a large spread of, of ages. You know, there were people in the study who were less than 20 years of age and there were people who were over 65 years. Most of the participants had a certificate three, certificate four, a diploma or a bachelor degree as their highest level of education. Uh, most of the participants had worked in disability services overall, so for any organisation in the disability sector for either three to five years, six to 10 years, or 15 years, of more, 15 years or more. And most of the participants had worked in their current service for either only one to two years, three to five years, or six to 10 years. Um, but again, there was a spread of, uh, of across, um, you know, of certain things. Like some people had worked in their service for uh, just more than two months, all the way up to fifteen years or more. And then most participants had work uh, work on average per week twenty six hours more, and that was more than seventy percent of the sample. Um, so there, are, here's the results of the exploratory factor analysis. We found that. Uh, the items form three dimensions of job satisfaction. So the first was called work conditions. Uh, this is because the items that loaded on this scale were about satisfaction with holiday and sick pay entitlements, uh, job security, flexibility of hours, and the number of hours worked. Second dimension was named tasks and development. This is because uh, the items that loaded most highly on this scale were about satisfaction with the variety of tasks staff do, uh, satisfaction with the actual tasks they do, level of challenge posed by the actual tasks, and developing their skills. And then the third factor was named management because 
Uh, the items were about staff satisfaction with the relationships with their senior managers, their contact with senior managers, um, and various other things, mostly to do with uh, senior management. Of the three scales, um, staff reported that on average, they were most satisfied with uh, tasks and development, but they were least satisfied with management, which is probably uh, no surprises there because that's uh, a common finding across studies that staff often report uh, they're least satisfied with management. Okay, so now that we have the three dimensions of job satisfaction, uh, the next part of the analysis and the, and the main aim was to examine what factors were associated with the dimensions of job satisfaction. So the predictors of work conditions were experience in the disability sector, which was negatively associated with um, work conditions, and experience in their current service was positively associated with work conditions, um, so that requires a bit of explaining. So what that means is that staff who have worked in the sector for longer had less job satisfaction compared to those who were, I guess, newer into the sector. And those who had worked in their current service for longer were more satisfied than staff who were new into that service. So for an example, this is sort of just, a, uh, just to kind of provide some context, a worker that's been in the sector for, let's say, 15 years and has been working in their current service for, let's say, two years is was less satisfied than uh, a worker who had been working in the sector for, let's say, three years and worked in their current service for three years. So that's just sort of an example to provide clarity around what that uh, means. Uh, the other predictors of work conditions were role conflict, um, less, uh, sorry, less role conflict and more role clarity. And then the dimension of culture that predicted work conditions was collaboration in the organisation. So that's um, the extent to which staff feel that their senior managers provide them with support. So in blue on the slide there uh, were the variables which were at the individual level or the worker level, and then in red are the predictor variables that are at the service level. Um, so the predictors of satisfaction with tasks and development were more role clarity and um, the average level enga of engagement of the people supported. So that was an interesting finding. So what this means is that staff who work in services where the people they support are more engaged in meaningful activities and social interactions, um, are more satisfied with the tasks they do um, and their development. So it sort of suggests that staff are more satisfied with the things they do on a day-to-day -day basis if the people they support are typically more engaged in meaningful activities and social interaction. So it sort of um, provides a bit of an indication that in services where there's active support that's been uh, implemented and embedded, then staff are more satisfied with the tasks and uh, their development. Uh, the third factor, which was management, this was predicted um, by role clarity and having more hours per week, as well as the culture dimension collaboration in the organization. And actually there were two models that predicted management. Um, the reason why I sort of put them both there is because they were equal in how much um, variance they explained or, um, so the second model was, uh, sorry, included role clarity. Uh, frontline supervisors were more satisfied than support workers with management. And again, collaboration in the organization uh, was found to be a predictor of um, staff satisfaction with management. So the variables that were found to be significant predictors of job satisfaction were uh, fairly precise, um, which meant that there were other variables which were not found to be significant predictors. So for instance, gender and education weren't predicted to, uh, weren't associated with uh, job satisfaction which is kind of uh, reflective of previous research because there's been sort of mixed evidence around uh, whether gender or education is associated with job satisfaction. Um, and the other variables which were not predictors were the other six dimensions of culture uh, that we examined, practice leadership, as well as average levels of adaptive behavior and challenging behavior. But 
Uh, I don't think this analysis um, sort of says or rules out that these other variables are not important to staff and not important to staff satisfaction. This analysis, sort of, it just says that in terms of these dimensions of job satisfaction, these other variables were not found to be predictors. If we use other dimensions of job satisfaction, looking at um, other things that are important to them, then perhaps those variables uh, would be found to be significant predictors. So this study has um, consistent with previous research found that organizational factors were significant predictors of job satisfaction, in particular uh, role clarity and the dimension of culture collaboration within the organization um, seem to matter in terms of uh, staff satisfaction. And the good news is that these can be influenced by senior management. So in terms of role clarity, senior managers can set clear ex expectations to staff and provide staff with clear information about their role. In terms of collaboration with frontline staff, uh, good collaboration, uh, how, what that looks like see, is senior managers having regular contact with staff, senior managers understanding what it's like to work in the service and knowing what is happening there, uh, helping staff find solutions to uh, problems that happen in the service, and also involving staff in decision making. And based on our previous research, looking at uh, this dimension of culture, there are, there are opportunities to improve collaboration within organizations because of the seven dimensions, this is one where staff consistently rate low. Um, so it seems, or there definitely is, opportunities for senior managers to improve uh, the culture in their organizations and services in terms of how much collaboration there is between them and frontline staff. And what we see in services where there's poor collaboration is that staff feel isolated from the broader organization and that they're on their own. So it's kind of like the, the service or the group home is isolated within the broader organization. Um, in terms of their relationships with senior management, there's a feeling that it's them versus us and that they're not involved in decision-making. <clears throat> so um, more recently, I've been doing quite a lot of reading into studies that have examined staff outcomes. So uh, things like stress, burnout, intention to quit. And it's interesting that there's consistent themes across these studies into staff outcomes that staff report that the uh, things that are associated with staff outcomes or poor staff outcomes is a lack of control or a lack of influence in their work, a lack of participation in decision-making and a lack of support from management. So from there, I was kind of thinking or well, wanted to know, well, what is it that senior managers could actually, what could they actually do? Or what does the evidence or what does the literature say that they should do in order to uh, address these issues for staff? And uh, the literature says that senior managers should be approachable. They should listen to staff. They should seek staff input on decisions that affect them and the people they support. Um, they should respect staff knowledge. Um, what comes out of much of the qualitative research um, is that staff say that they've got good knowledge of the people they support and what happens in the services, uh, yet uh, senior managers don't always respect it or they make decisions without um, finding, oh, without consulting staff and using their sort of practice wisdom um, to inform decisions and about what happens in the service. And the other thing is that senior managers should value staff and their well-being. Um, however, these ideas are often uh, these ideas are from theory or from studies that are qualitative studies that um, ask the staff responses about what they think managers should do. So there's a real need for research, for experimental research to actually test out what works. Because um, my reading of the research, which is uh, you know several decades of research that's looked in, into this is that no one's properly tested you know um, training managers in how to do this and followed up um, you know what works or what doesn't work. So um, I just want to acknowledge some limitations with the current study. Uh, one of which is common source bias. So much of the data was collected um, from staff completing surveys. So there's sort of a common source bias in that. Um, both in, um, independent and dependent variables came from the same source. Uh, there's potentially variables not collected that we used in this study. So for instance, um, 
uh, one particular um, variable which could be important, which is about staff, is what's called core self-evaluations. So this is sort of a measure that's similar to self-efficacy and locus of control, which in uh, fields other than the disability sector has been um, used frequently and found that uh, staff who are high on core self-evaluation is associated with job satisfaction. And just to conclude, uh, the study suggests that enhancing organizational factors may increase staff members' job satisfaction, which may contribute to better staff performance and reduce turnover. Thank you. All right. So welcome to the second half of this afternoon's uh, seminar, which <laughs> was slightly disrupted by a thunderstorm here at Bandura. Um, let's hope it's gone away now. So um, I'm Chris Bigby. I'm going to present this second paper, which is about family perspectives about group home experiences of people with severe intellectual disabilities. Um, and it's a paper that was jointly developed with Dr. Aaron uh, Jackson, who is, who is still part of the Living with Disability Research Centre. So the background to this paper is that as everybody's aware, I guess, over the last few years, there's been an increasing emphasis on trying to hear from people with intellectual disabilities and other service users about their views and their experiences of services um, so that services can be much more responsive and improve quality. Um, but one of the groups that we seldom hear from are people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities uh, because of the difficulties that this group have in, in self-advocating um, and in talking about sort of bigger picture issues. If you want to really understand what's happening for that group, you need to spend time with them uh, and observe what their life experiences is rather than trying to ask them to fill in questionnaires about satisfaction. Um, and interestingly, this group are also really underrepresented I would argue by many of the sort of advocacy groups um, because they are a relatively small group um, and they they really don't have a loud voice and traditionally they've been represented by by family members um, and sometimes uh, there's, there's a sense that it's not necessarily appropriate for parents to represent the views of their adult children. Um, but I would argue that family members uh, who have a close relationship with somebody with a more severe intellectual disability are likely to have insights into the quality of services um, that are really important. And we should listen to what family members say about their views about quality of services and the experience of the people of their family members. There's actually very limited research on family perspectives about the quality of supported accommodation services. There's quite a lot about the, the instrumental and the emotional roles that family members play with their family, uh, that family members play with their adults with intellectual disabilities, but there's not a lot about their perspectives about the quality of services. What there is suggests that family members want to be acknowledged as, as partners um, in providing care and support to their family member. They, they value having a good relationship with staff they also value continuity of support for their family member and that they want staff to actually know their relative, uh, know the person that's being supported. Um, they also want their relative to be treated respectfully and to be supported, to be engaged and to exercise self-determination. So the very limited research in this area tends to uh, in many ways reflect some of the research about good practice uh, in supported accommodation services, but we really haven't heard much from families about these issues. So the aim of this, this study um, was to try and understand what involved family members think about the quality of group home services where their relatives live um, and what is important from a family member's perspective to quality. So the data is drawn from, from the longitudinal study of group homes that Lincoln talked about, which uses observational methods. We recruited 23 family members of 21 people who had severe or more profound intellectual disabilities. And 
all of the family members that we recruited were in weekly contact uh, with the person who lived in the group home. So as you can see, there were but brothers, fathers, sisters, but predominantly uh, the informants were mothers and predominantly they were also women. Um, so the sample was taken from 17 group homes that were managed by four of the organisations that are in our study. And uh, we conducted semi-structured interviews with family members, asking them about their perceptions of service quality. And we also asked them a very specific question about whether they would contemplate supporting their relative to move house. Um, we recorded all the interviews and they were transcribed and we used uh, qualitative uh, analysis using grounded theory methods, which is an inductive analysis. So we didn't start off with any preconceptions or any theory we wanted to prove. We let the findings emerge um, from, from the data. So just some basic uh, facts. Um, the people whose family members participated in this study on average, they were they were aged 52 years and there was a range from 28 to 80. So it was quite a spread of people that were living in group homes and their adaptive behavior scores were on average 90. And they ranged from being 27 to 151. 151 was the cutoff that we generally use to signify that people have high support needs and therefore severe or profound intellectual disabilities. So everybody fell within that severe and profound range. We had data about all of these services where people were living um, from the bigger study. Uh, so we had data already about the quality of active support and the quality of frontline practice leadership. And as you can see, the average quality of active support in the services was 52%, um, compared to 66%, which is good active support. But there was a range, again, from 23 to 91 on those scores. And there was also a, a range of the strength of frontline practice leadership um, from 2 to 3.6 on a five-point scale with an average of 2.75. So the services weren't great, uh, but they weren't really poor either. So they were, they were pretty uh, mediocre uh, services on both the scale of frontline practice leadership and on active support. So sort of bear that in mind, I guess, in terms of what family members had to say. So consistently, all the family members uh, talked about uh, life's being pretty good at the moment. So most of them were happy with the quality of services that their family member was getting at that time when we did the interview, sort of at that moment. Um, and they tended to uh, roll together, thinking about staff, thinking about leadership, and thinking about the teamwork that was going on in the house. And as one family member said, look, I think I'm pretty lucky with the staff we've got. They seem to work together harmoniously, and I never see any backbiting or what have you with them. There doesn't seem to be any politics really amongst them. If the present staff stay on, I would be more than happy for him to stay where he is, talking about her brother. Actually, the setup he's got there, the care, yes, I'm very happy with it. So it's this sense of the way in which the staff work together and the, the sort of atmosphere and culture of the house. None of the family members that we talked to uh, were willing to contemplate their family member thinking about moving. Uh, either at that time we talked to them or in the future, which was surprising <laughs> given that they also talked about having a sense of uncertainty and a bit of a dread about the changes that might happen in the future. So one of the family members says, well, we know these good people talking about the staff at the moment won't be around forever. We do, we do dread that day all of the time. There's always that fear in the back of our minds that what's working well now may not continue to work well in the future. And what is a good story for her now may end up as a bad story in the future. And that was echoed across all of the family members that things were fine at this point in time, but they may change in the future and they may change 
for the worst uh, because in the past things had been up and down and they'd seen those changes happen. So they talked about the frequent changes that they'd seen happen in the quality of services uh, over time. They talked about the changes that they'd seen uh, in the strength of leadership in the service, in the strength of the frontline managers. Um, and, and one of them talk, talked about the, the, that people don't often stay for very long. So there was this turnover of frontline managers. And Kerry said they stay for three months, maybe six months, maybe a year, and then they leave. There's been some really good ones and there's been some real shockers. And at the moment, we don't have one at all. Um, and another one said, we didn't have a team leader for six months. It was an absolute mess. So there was this sense that the leaders were really important, but the leaders came and went. And it was potluck, whether you got a good one, whether you got a shocker, or whether you had one at all for a period of time. And there was a sense too that the atmosphere within the house was, was significantly influenced by the leaders. Um, and, and so one of them said, it's just a wonderful home. All the clients and the staff were happy in this happy working environment. And then she said, the staff, the frontline manager took leave and a temporary house supervisor came in and she undermined the protocols that were working really well. She changed the dynamics of the house. So a change of leader can really change quite dy dynamically what, what's happened, what's happening in the house. And the other important change that they talked about was changeover of support workers um, and how important it was for support workers to know the people they were supporting, but how often uh, that wasn't the case. And they talked about the, the turnover of support workers and Kerry said, for instance, but they just move on. So there's nobody there now who's been there a long time. And they were very concerned about agency staff coming in or casual staff coming in when they don't know one client from the other. So it becomes, as she said, guesswork for them. And it can be a bit of a risk. And a number of family members talked about um, how workers who don't know the person that they're supporting um, can actually spark off uh, quite challenging behaviours from people because they might get uh, up too close to them or they might not know how to communicate or how to respond to them. Uh, so there was a sense that it was it was really uh, quite risky if staff uh, didn't know the people that they were supporting, but that that was a frequent occurrence. So they talked a lot then about the importance of strong leadership, um, saying that it it only works when you've got a person who's giving good, clear leadership. Um, and they saw that as being someone who knows what's going on, um, someone who was monitoring for when things go wrong, someone who was ensuring that staff were working as a team and that was mentoring the staff, someone who was problem solving, and importantly, someone who was creating new options and pushing boundaries for the people that they were supporting and also leading communication uh, with, with families. Um, so they, need, they wanted somebody who was leading what was happening. Um, and that, as this quote illustrates, that becomes more important when you've got staff turnover. Um, so I'll just read this out because I think it, it says a lot, this quote. It says, the staff that comes and goes, you need a manager who needs to say that fridge needs to be cleaned out and that needs to be looked after. They need one person in there who knows what's happening somebody that is actually controlling what's being made on the menu. How do we know that Julie isn't eating spaghetti bolognese every night of the week? Because there's a different carer that comes in and that's their go-to meal. Oh, well, we'll have, I'll make spaghetti bolognese. And then the next one comes in, oh, I'll make spaghetti bolognese. If you don't have that overall managed situation, I think that's where it lacks. So if you've got no coordination, nobody understanding what's happening every day of the week and nobody monitoring that and monitoring the quality of staff, then that, that families felt that things had a potential to really go wrong in terms of the quality of support that was being provided. So they saw that good leaders were much more than good managers. 
um, that good leaders were people that were caring, compassionate, that were good communicators, people that had energy and, and passion, uh, people that knew the people that were being supported in the in the service and that had a good relationship with them and that could ensure a collective approach amongst the staff to support. Um, so some of these things weren't connected necessarily with skills, but with the with the characteristics of frontline managers. As one said, I love her energy and her passion for people with a disability. I mean, she really loves them and she's close to them. They relate to her, she talks to them. You can have a person who's got all the administrative skills in the world and that can run a house effectively, but if they don't have compassion and the pull, then they'll never warm to her, meaning the people that are being supported will never warm to her. And the other comment here was, it's this way of working in the house that Roy, the, the frontline manager, set up. I know they have monthly, weekly meetings and, and they'd, you know, say Archie was a bit off or something, then they'd discuss that and they'd sort out what to do with it. So having a leader meant that issues weren't ignored, that if somebody noticed there was something uh, not quite right with one of the people that was being supported, then the manager would 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 take the lead in trying to work out uh, what the problem was um, and getting other people to, to understand and to contribute their ideas about what was happening for that person. The other thing they saw that was really important to, um, to good quality services was good support workers. And they described, again, support workers in terms of their, their personal characteristics. So they talked about support workers who were lovely, who were caring, who were understanding and kind. Um, and they saw it as very important that good support workers had strong relationships with the people that they were supporting. Um, I know that they care about him because I can see when I've been to the house. They seem to go out of their way to make sure he has what he needs, what he needs. Um, and there was a sense that good support workers did more than they had to. Um, so there are two kinds of staff that get into disability care. The ones who really care and want to make a difference and the ones who are there because they couldn't get a job anywhere else and it's only financial to them. And so they're very much more removed from the client and they're very cold. And again, when they were talking about good support workers, they emphasized how important it was for the support workers to know the people that they were supporting um, for all sorts of reasons, but predominantly in terms of being able to understand the person's communication and understand the person's preferences and be able to uh, offer and acknowledge and respect the person's choice. So we talked quite a lot to families about um, the external environment and whether uh, that affected uh, the quality of services. Um, and by the external environment, we meant um, the organization that was running, managing the service. So families very much talked about what went on within the service, within the group home, and that was their main concern. Um, but then they saw the group home existing within a bigger organization. Um, and, and a lot of them talked about that the bigger organizations and maybe beyond that were creating more paperwork and more transactions that seemed to undermine the quality of services. So without any prompting, um, family members talked about the frontline managers doing being more administrators than they'd ever been before. Um, and one of them said they all seem to all they seem to be doing is reporting and stuff on their computers and stuff like that. They don't seem to interact with the clients. And another one said they're very much bogged down in the paperwork. They're being overwhelmed with too much paperwork and less hands on. What used to be a one page document is now turning into 20 pages per agreement. So they were very conscious that the managers and sometimes the frontline workers as well seem to be doing more paperwork than they'd done in the past. And interestingly enough, um, given the emphasis on, on choice of services and choice of organisations that is now available to people with disabilities and their families, the family members that we talked to had actually very little contact with the organisations 
that were managing the services where their relatives uh, were. And they were really confused about the bigger NDIS system. So talking about the organization that managed uh, the service, um, they said, no, I haven't met anybody from there. Yeah, I wouldn't even know where they are. Um, I haven't really cared because my communications have always been with the house staff. I can't figure out who's who. There's so many. Even doing the NDIS plan, there's about eight people involved. So there was a sense that they didn't really understand who was in this bigger in the bigger organization, uh, what they did, and how you might communicate with them, um, and that they really weren't particularly important. So, in conclusion, it was, I think, very concerning that family members were resigned to considerable uncertainty about the future, about the quality of support in the future. And they saw that the quality of support was likely to change and be quite variable over time. But despite that, nobody was interested uh, in supporting a move for their family member. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to that, I think, and, and, and think about what that, the implications of that. So the findings um, about the views of families, they align quite well with the limited literature um, that we already had about families of people living in group homes. It seems that families value the continuity of support, um, staff knowing their relative, their relative being supported to be engaged and to exercise self-determination. So families valued many of these things that are uh, seen as important um, to good practice. And their, their views also reflected many of the things that have been identified as being important parts of frontline practice leadership um, and of active support, of supporting engagement, consistency, and knowing the person um, are seen to be keys to good support by family members who, who most of the time have very little uh, knowledge of the sort of bigger literature about what good, what constitutes good practice. But that from their experience, what the literature says is, is also uh, reflected in their experiences of what makes uh, for good services. They didn't see the significance of broader organisations, um, but they did identify this growth of paperwork and the negative impact of that paperwork, probably from the NDIS, on the, cli the client focus that was happening in supported accommodation services. And again, that was very similar to uh, the research that we've reported on before um, about uh, practice leadership um, and uh, how practice leaders are getting diverted from leading practice to doing paperwork uh, within supported accommodation services. So in the context, uh, particularly, I think, of the NDIS review and the Disability Role Commission, uh, which are both suggesting that people that live in group homes should be offered much greater choice about where they might live um, and that they should be supported to begin to explore alternatives. Um, the fact that none of the families were interested in thinking about a move in the future really poses a challenge about how um, will people with more severe and profound intellectual disabilities be supported to explore alternative accommodation options if that's not on the radar of their family members at all. Um, and it suggests that uh, in order to offer people more options, there's going to have to be some concerted engagement with family members um, to talk about, well, what the alternatives might be, why the alternatives might be better, um, will the alternatives uh, stop this uh, churn and turnover of staff that was of such concern uh, to the to family members? Um, and I guess that goes back to the sort of major issue um, that goes to staff satisfaction about one of the major challenges then would be is about how to reduce staff change and to strengthen leadership um, in supported accommodation services. And those things not only go to uh, good quality service and support, but they also go to staff satisfaction. If you get more staff satisfaction, then there's less likely that, that staff are going to change. So that's, these things sort of fold together, uh, I guess, with what Lincoln was talking about, the predictors 
of staff satisfaction. And it sort of harks back, I think, in many ways to the position uh, where uh, when we started to close institutions in the 70s and 80s, um, many families didn't want to think about a change um, because they saw their person as, as having an okay life where they were and didn't want to um, make that change or think about that change because they were worried that that might make things worse uh, rather than improving it. And so I think we need to think very seriously about the parallels um, of supporting families who were leaving institutions uh, to think about how families might be supported to think about alternative options for their family members with severe and profound intellectual disabilities um, if we are going to offer more choice and more options to this group of people who predominantly rely on their families um, to support them to make decisions. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. So thanks very much for coming and for, for the questions. Um, our next seminar is on the second Wednesday of October, um, and we will be sending out information about that. That will be on Wednesday, the 9th of October, um, and we will have two presentations around uh, supporting decision making and supporting autonomy of people with intellectual disabilities. So uh, Jenna McNabb has just completed and submitted her PhD, which is a fantastic study of the way in which guardians um, in New South Wales support, uh, make decisions with the people that they have, that they're mandated to make decisions for. Um, and it provides some, some really interesting insights into how they do that and how they try and use a supportive decision-making approach, even though they're mandated to make substitute decisions in people's best interests. Um, and then the second presentation will be from uh, charity Sims Jenkins, who uh, is close to, uh, cl closer, but not, not quite there yet in terms of submitting her PhD, which is looking at how support workers um, think about uh, how they're supporting people to um to make to make uh, choices and preferences and follow through on those preferences so it's not necessarily looking at decision making it's about looking at how they're supporting people to to fulfill their preferences um, and again that's a, a very interesting study um, and she's got some some great data and and is developing a, a really interesting theoretical model around that and if you look on our website under seminars, you can find the recordings of, of all the previous uh, seminars. Um, so thanks very much for coming. Please be in touch if you've got any queries or, or um, you want to follow up anything. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.